Dr. Agnello DeSanto is a, an assistant professor at, of, in the linguistics department at the University of Utah. Um, before joining Utah, he received his, uh, his doctorate in linguistics from Stony Brook University. Uh, and his research lies mostly at the intersection of computational, theoretical, and experimental linguistics. Um, he's particularly interested in investigating how linguistic representations interact with general cognitive processes. With a with particular focus on sentence processing and learnability, uh, so in his past work, he has mostly made use of uh, symbolic approaches grounded in formal language theory and uh, Richard Grammar formalisms, like minimalist grammars and, and tree adjoining grammars. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Uh, hi. Yeah, I'm really excited about being here. Uh, very quickly, in case you want the slides to follow along, if you screenshot the QR code, they should appear. It's not going to be the most updated version, but they're mostly there. Um, and yeah, so thanks for having me. It's always good to have an excuse to chat about things that I at least found interesting. Hopefully, you'll find them interesting too. Um, I gave the talk this kind of very broad title, Mathematical Linguistics and Typological Complexity. And while then I was making the slides, I got a bit annoyed at myself for using complexity in the title, uh, because we know that there are so many different ways in which we can understand what complexity actually means. And I often sometimes complain that yeah, complexity by itself is really of a vacuous term. Uh, so I'm going to try to make the effort of clarifying what actually, what the specific notion of complexity that I'm interested in is. And this doesn't mean that other notions of complexity are not as interesting. It's just that I'm not going to talk about those. And I want to start by kind of characterizing this kind of talking a broader questions that I'm interested in, which is these questions about whether uh, our linguistic knowledge is shows regularities, so some kind of laws. You don't have to commit to whatever ontological claim laws seems to be making. I'm really just thinking about if we look at how human linguistic knowledge behaves, do we see regularities in these kind of patterns? And if we do, uh, why are those? Where, where do they arise from? And how are they in any way related to what I'm going to call typological gaps? Just this idea of logically conceivable patterns that we don't seem to find. And I'm going to make the point here on clarifying that when I say this, I really mean classes of patterns, not individual phenomena. And then the question is, how do we actually define what the class of patterns is? Uh, and then this connects to these broader questions of, is any of this telling us anything about human cognition broadly and specifically about human learning processes? Um, and unsurprisingly, I think to this kind of audience, I'm gonna make the claim that a good way of framing these kind of questions is by approaching them in this kind of cross-disciplinary intersection, uh, which doesn't really mean uh, stealing tools from each other, but it really means reframing the questions that we have in a way that, that they are understandable from all the different sub-disciplines we want to work in so that we can gain insight from each other, we can, uh, and then we can provide multiple explanatory levels for the kind of phenomena that we are interested in. Uh, that said, uh, the way this is going to go then, I'm going to spend the first chunk of this talk trying to characterize what I mean by complexity in this kind of formal language theoretical framework. And I'm going to show you intuitively at least how can we provide some of these kind of characterizations for linguistic dependencies. Uh, then I'm going to make the case that it's not just a matter of forcing our uh, linguistic patterns into the maths, but actually our mathematical characterization can learn, our understanding of the formalisms can improve based on our typological explorations. And this is going to give us ways of making precise predictions between attested or unattested phenomena that we can test in laboratory settings. And then I'm going to shut up if you're all still going to be with me. Uh, okay, so let's start from the beginning then. And yeah, so the notion of complexity that I'm really interested in here is in this framework of formal language theoretic characterizations. So I'm going to talk about languages as string sets, although we could talk about sets of structures, but specifically today I'm going to talk about strings, then be classified according to the complexity of the devices that we can use to generate them. So here, this is a classic representation of the Chomsky-Schutzenberg hierarchy. I'm going to say Chomsky hierarchy from now on, but let's not forget about Schutzenberg. Um, and so this has been used extensively to debate the positioning of linguistic dependencies with respect of this kind of nested region of complexity that we see here. Right? So this kind of complexity characterizations, regular context free, mildly context sensitive, have allowed researchers to draw kind of connections between attested linguistic patterns and the expressivity of the machinery that it's used to recognize or generate them. I, uh, so this has been an interesting kind of approach going hand in hand with linguistics for the past 60 years. 
um, because it allows us to make pre to establish precise prediction, sorry, establish precise theories about what kind of patterns we see that leads to precise predictions in terms, for example, of topological patterns. I, why, uh, if we assume that phonology is regular, so it can be recognized by finite state devices, then we don't expect dependencies like center embedded dependencies in phonology. We can make speculations about formal learning frameworks. We can also, depending on how strongly we commit to this kind of formal mechanisms, we can ask questions about what kind of, for example, memory representations we might need to recognize phonological dependencies versus syntactic dependencies. Um, now, I want to make the case then, so these kind of clusters have been used to make, um, so they make they provide a measure of descriptive adequacy for any kind of theories that want to account for the distribution of linguistic patterns and have been tied to this kind of typological investigation since the beginning. So the way they've been going about it is like, oh, I can look at Navajo sibilant harmony. What kind of mechanisms do I need to recognize that uh, compared to the mechanisms that I might need to recognize with German cross serial dependencies? And notice that this kind of shift between looking at the specific pattern and making broader claims about linguistic systems is not a trivial mathematical claim. Um, and if you haven't had the chance, I really encourage you to check the beautiful paper by Schieber in 85, in which he does that for cross-serial dependencies. The proofs there are fantastic. But anyway, slightly stepping in this, um, I really want to stress this, that here then we are typing, tying the, um, our typological investigations to speculations about these kind of mechanisms. But this also means that often, um, this has been done by focusing on the properties of the machines that we are associating to these clusters, right? So regular languages are associated to finite state devices, context-free languages maybe require push-down automata. And so the differences between these clusters, these kind of hard boundaries, are really established thanks to the considerations about these differences in mechanisms. But then I want to argue that then this is shifting our attention a bit to the fact that the reason we find these characterizations interesting is for the setting of the patterns that we have. Um, and so focusing on the mechanisms instead kind of leads us to treat these regions as kind of monolithic blocks. And we tend to forget that in fact, all of these different levels can by themselves be decomposed in richer hierarchies of languages. In fact, the mildly context sensitive boundary was not there at the beginning, it was added after. Uh, and so, for example, if we focus on the regular region, this idea that every language in the regular region can be recognized by fancy devices is true, but it shifted our attention to the fact that then the, the patterns in this kind of region are actually differ in significant ways. And so the regular region itself can be decomposing richer hierarchies of clusters of decreasing complexity. And here I have a screenshot of one of these possible hierarchies. There are multiples. Um, I'm representing this on a grid because I want to highlight how we have this kind of subsumption relations that the ellipses that I had before we were showing, but also that these kind of languages can be characterized in terms of uh, logics, for example, does highlighting properties of patterns that are not dependent on the structure of the specific recognition mechanisms. So here we are providing instead descriptive characterizations to focus on the kind of unit of information that are necessary to distinguish strings that present a certain pattern versus strings that do not, All right? And so as the kind of hierarchical characterizations that I'm showing you here are based on this kind of fundamental information, then any device, let's say, wants to recognize what I'm calling a strictly local language versus a strictly piecewise language is gonna have to be sensitive to that kind of information. And so we can draw distinctions, for example, in terms of the kind of logical operators that are required to recognize certain strings over other. Like here, I'm marking successor, which is immediate adjacency versus things like precedence. So um, additionally, apart on, on top of the logical characterizations, we can give the classical algebraic uh, grammar-based automata characterizations of languages in these classes. And so although these languages do not presuppose any specific recognition mechanism, they still allow us to characterize possible mechanisms that allow generalizations over these classes. Um, and so they allow us to speculate about the processes involved in the recognition. But the point is that they are, we are, they are really allowing us to pinpoint fundamental core units of information specific to certain patterns over others. Um, and so in this sense, so this kind of hierarchy has been around for a while, at least from the work 
of McNaughton and Papert in the 70s, but in computational phonology, I've seen a relatively recent renaissance in terms of people noticing that in fact, the majority of phonologically attested patterns seem to be subregular. Uh, and here, this is a representation of the same class. It's a bit simplified, so it fits in the slide and is kind of just highlighting the subsumption relations. And we could be talking about phonological mappings, but so in this talk, I'm going to be a bit shallow. I'm going to switch between phonology, phonotactics, morphology, morphotactics all the time. But actually, these kind of characterizations are meant to um, classify the complexity of the string sets. So I'm only talking really about phonotactics here, for example, with firmness of strings. And in this sense, this talk is kind of a sister talk of something that you heard in summer by John Rusky. Uh, so if you're interested in the complexity of the mappings and functional relations, I encourage you to check that talk instead. Um, now, what I want to do in, this, in the next you know, five minutes of this session is to show you, okay, so what do we mean that we can use this kind of formal characterizations to uh, look at the properties of linguistic dependencies? I'm gonna focus on two specific classes at the bottom of this hierarchy, but I'm gonna call the strictly local class and the tier based strictly local class. Um, so the first kind of dependencies that I want us to consider is the local dependencies. These are dependencies between immediately adjacent segments. And remember, uh, I'm only interested in the well formness of strings. So this idea that I want devices that are able to distinguish that in German language that has word final devising, we have distinction between strings that might end with a voice segments but are ill-formed and strings that are might end with the voiceless segments and so are ill-formed, well-formed. And similarly, we have phenomena like intervocalic voicing where an, a segment in between two vowels has to be voiced. And so the claim that I'm making here is that these kind of patterns can be described by what are called strictly local constraints, which are basically n-gram constraints. So the idea is, uh, how do I distinguish between a string like here, red, on the left, and a string like here on the right? Well, I only need to be able to capture the relation between the voice, voicing of the segment at the end of the word and the fact that it's at the end of the word. And throughout the talk, I'm gonna mark word edges with these kind of symbols. I'm not making any kind of ontological commitment to the reality of those symbols, except to the fact that we as humans are clearly able to perceive that something is at the end of the word or not. Um, so I'm marking that just because it makes the representations easier. So how do I capture this kind of, this well-formedness contrast? I just basically need bigram constraints at the end of the word. And I could capture a similar phenomenon here with a trigram constraint that captures the relation between the two vowels. Now, these are interesting uh, models because, as we know, n-gram models are fairly simple. They are mathematically well-behaved. But of course, it's not surprising to probably any of you that uh, dependencies in phonology are not just about between immediately adjacent segments. So we have uh, dependencies that capture relation between arbitrarily distant segments. So I have here an example from Samala. This is a case of sibilant harmony in anteriority meaning that if you have multiple sibilants within a string, they all either need to be palatalized or not. So you cannot have things like se, sh or sh, s. You can have like things like sh, sh. You could have uh, something like se, s. Now, how do we capture this kind of well formness contrast? You might say, well, you can still kind of use n-gram constraints, right? They span from one sibilant to the other. But uh, since these sibilants can be for arbitrarily far apart from each other, the problem is that I'm not going to have a single fixed n-gram window that is able to account for this kind of property throughout every word in the language. And moreover, we are missing the kind of generalization that this is really a property between the two sibilants. All these other segments in between that are pushing the boundaries of this kind of strict local limitations have nothing to do with the similar harmony process. Um, and so in autosegmental phonology, there is this idea of, well, there are relations that only have to happen between uh, a relativized set of the segments of a word, right? just sibilance, for example. A way of formalizing this idea comes from uh, this kind of cost here based strictly local languages that says exactly that. I'm going to create a relativized domain, an abstraction over the original representation uh, of segments that I care about. And then over that domain, some relations are going to be local again. So I'm going to be able to apply strictly local constraints. Um, so this is something that's easier to kind of see than to do. Uh, than to hear about. So again, remember, I'm trying to capture this idea of sibilant harmony. So sibilants are the only kind of segments that are relevant for me. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create this kind of relativized domain, which projects sibilants for the original string by maintaining the respective ordering relations. And so this time, there is no element in between the sibilants on the tier. 
So I can apply local constraints. Now I'm doing this visually. Uh, this doesn't mean that, that we are actually projecting this here, right? So I could express it in terms of uh, uh, a relativized local operator in logical terms, uh, but the representation helps to kind of understand what do we mean by saying these segments are local to respect to each other. Um, now, um, so the, these kind of things can in fact account for a variety of long distance phonotactic dependencies, and they are very, very similar to the strictly local grammars, except for this idea that locality is defined in a slightly different way. Um, so I'm gonna pause for a second, but just to summarize what I did in this first part, I'm trying to push this idea that we can look at patterns in terms of these formal language theoretical ways, but we are moving away from this monolithic idea of just looking at the devices, fine state automata, we are really looking at ways to understand what the properties of these patterns are so that we can fully see what's the difference between a strictly local, a local phenomenon and a non-local phenomenon. The argument is that some of these clusters are fairly linguistically natural, like I'm encoding ideas that were already around in the linguistic literature. They can capture a wide range of phenotypic dependencies and might give us some insights about how learning constraints are related to typological attestations or not. And so in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna to try to address those two other points, but I'm gonna take a breath, take a sip of tea and see if you have any questions. This was a bit fast, sorry. No, that was great. Thanks so much for like uh, uh, being able to like provide so much information as, as well as like, uh, you know, background on the subject. Uh, does anybody have any, have any questions on, on that connection to linguistics and formal language theory that was just reviewed? So it's a very broad introduction, so I understand if you don't. Oh, I see that you posted the Shiver paper, so thanks. That's a quick yeah, is that the right one? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, is, uh, I can go on. Anything? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Um, I'm, just, I'm just checking the chat to see if there were any questions. But yeah, no, I, it sounds like, uh, yeah, you're, you're good to go on. Cool. And you know, if as I talk, you think, oh, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying before, you can always ask me later. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's jump right back in. Uh, we kind of stopped here, right? So I'm pushing this idea that looking at this kind of finer grain characterizations uh, might be useful in terms of understanding properties of the linguistic patterns that we are interested in. And but now you might ask, well, okay, what are we doing then? Yeah, maybe this difference between tier based strict local and strict local is pointing at this fundamental difference in properties. But what's the goal? Are we trying to claim that every long distance phenotypic pattern is actually tier based strict local? And, and in fact, we have a variety of patterns that have arise in, in particular in the last few years that are not. Um, and so, what I want to point out in this third, second part of the talk is that we can use. Uh, this typological knowledge that we have to push the ex formal explorations of these regions to understand more what kind of distinctions these kind of classes can do and what kind of distinctions they cannot do. Um, so in order to do this, I'm gonna uh, make one example. And again, I'm gonna focus on this tier based strict local class. And I'm gonna start from the observation that um, this is based on some work that Thomas Graf and I did a few years ago, that the class of tier based strict local languages is not closed under intersection. What does that mean? It means that say, imagine that I have a pattern like vowel harmony and I have a pattern like sibilant harmony. I can characterize those in terms of tier based strict local grammars. But if I were interested then in designing a grammar that accounts for both of them, I will not be able to guarantee that the target language were still tier based strict local. This is a bit unsatisfying from a linguistic perspective because intersection closure is a property that we want to have, right? So languages have multiple patterns, multiple constraints, and we want to try to understand what the cumulative uh, effort of those constraints generating. Uh, moreover, it turns out that there are a variety of patterns that might be better analyzed in terms of this kind of non-intersect interacting processes. Um, and so I'm going to show you how we can use in pattern observations about these kind of patterns to uh, formulate new uh, kind of formal classes. So a bit of linguistics, um, shallow linguistics, but a bit. Uh, so this is a, a case of sibilant harmony from a Berber language. Uh, we can see that in this language, you have this kind of causative prefix that surfaces as an S if there is no other sibilant in the word, or if any other sibilant in the stem is either a voiceless, a non-palatalized uh, sibilant. Uh, the language then has a case of sibilant harmony similar to the one that we saw before. We can see that sibilants uh, the, the prefix has to agree with whatever other sibilant is in the stem, but in anteriority, like in 2A, and in voicing, like in 2B. Uh, 
so it doesn't surface as an S anymore. Uh, and then the things get slightly more complicated because if there are any kind of voiceless obstruents in the stem, uh, then this kind of obstruents block the voicing, the agreement in voicing. So here we can see that we have a voiceless S and a voice Z, um, but they don't block the agreement in anteriority. So we still need to have a SH, J or a SZ. We cannot have SH for like that. And so we might ask, okay, this seems still similar to what we just did. So can I account for this in terms of this relativized domain that we did before? And the idea would be, well, okay, let's, let's try to think about what this is involving. First of all, it's involving a kind of sibilant harmony. So we want to create this kind of relativized domains that only care about sibilance. Uh, and then over those, I can check these bigram constraints that say, check whether the two things agree in voicing or agree in anteriority. This allows me to rule out things where there is no harmony and rule in things where there is harmony. Uh, and that is that uh, here I'm using negative grammar. So I'm literally writing those as constraints, but uh, I could write an equivalent grammar uh, listing the well-formed bigrams. It doesn't really matter. I'm choosing the um, negative constraints because in this specific case, it was shorter. And uh, okay, so this is the sibilant harmony pattern, but we might say, okay, so now I want to add the blocking phenomena. So the blocking phenomena is this voiceless substance like Q, Q, uh, block agreements in voicing. That means that they have to be part of my relativized domain. They are part of the relation that I'm trying to establish. So I have to put them on the tier and say, well, okay, so this is gonna work because if I use the bigram constraints that I used before, they are gonna block the local relation between the two sibilants. But, should not be particularly surprising though that if we look at this ring on the right now here there is a disagreement in voicing which is fine but there is also disagreement in anteriority which should not be fine we should not have it should be a like the one on the left uh, however since i'm putting the q on the tier again this q is blocking the two sibilance so it's also blocking the anteriority check you might say, well, you're a bit cheating here. Why are you using bigram constraints instead of trigrams that will be able to capture the differences between these two strings? And it's technically true. Uh, but again, the, the issue here is that these relations between arbitrary, this arbitrarily distinct sibilance, so I might have additional sibilance, sorry, might have additional obstruents in between here, and then the trigrams will not work. I will have to use four grams, five grams. And again, I will be missing the generalization, which is a more important point, that this Q, has nothing to do with the agreement in anteriority. It only affects the agreement in voicing. And so based on this intuition, Thompson and I were like, well, maybe this is really better analyzed as two separate processes that happen to share sibilance between each other. And so one way of looking at that, I say, well, okay, so let me write a grammar that deals with the agreement in voicing. And for this grammar, obstruents are going to be part of the tier. So I'm going to do the same thing as before, right? I'm going to put the obstruents and the sibilance on the tier, and I'm going to check these bigram relations, and it's going to be fine. And then I'm going to write a separate grammar, then here I'm representing as a separate tier, that as a slightly different relativized domain, in the tier, obstruents are going to not be on the tier because I have nothing to do with the sibilant harmony. And so in this case, I'm only going to project sibilance, and I'm going to, again, check bigram constraints. And now this is fine for this well-formed string. If we look at the ill-formed one, again, you remember the issue is that these two should be agreeing in anteriority. So I'm gonna, again, project the tier that checks for the agreement in voicing, and this is fine because there is an obstruence in between. And then I'm gonna check the agreement in anteriority. I'm gonna see, oh, this violates a constraint. Now this string is gonna be ill-formed because it's not well-formed on every possible tier that I can project. Uh, and so intuitively, this is exactly as if I was doing the intersection of the constraints of these two grammars. So this is not a tier-based strictly local pattern anymore, even though I'm conceptualizing it in terms of tiers, uh, but it's this idea of an intersection closure of the two separate tier grammar. This is useful in terms of phonotactics, but it's also showing us how we can use this kind of typological observation to learn more and more about what kind of possible formal relation we can expect in this kind of sub-regular region. And in fact, motivated by this kind of observation in the last few years, there has been a, an explosion of clusters in this hierarchy. We have been learning more and more and more different kind of relations that we can be establishing. And in fact, some of these clusters model the same kind of relations in different ways. 
So you may wonder, well, okay, what's the point then? Aren't we kind of shifting the goal over and over again by producing more and more fossils? And that would be a reasonable objection if our goal was to say, oh, I want to identify a single fossil that fits them all. But that's not the point. The point is that we want to use these kind of formal characterizations to highlight these fundamental properties that distinguish, say, a strictly local language from a tier-based strictly local language. So in a sense, doing this, for example, allow us to say, well, if I want to recognize a strictly local language, I need to be sensitive to successor. If I want to recognize a tier-based strictly local language, I need to at least be sensitive to this relativized notion of successor. And so using the typology to inform the fact that we need different kind of expressivity is a perk of the approach, it's malleable in that way. Um, this also allows us to talk once again about cross-domain parallels in a more kind of uh, common ground. So I started the talk with this kind of representation, right? That's saying, well, um, yeah, it's been argued that phonology can be captured by regular languages, but if you want to talk about syntactic dependencies over string, maybe I need uh, more expressive kind of representation of formal mechanisms. Uh, however, it's kind of well known that a variety of the grammar of grammar formalisms that can generate these mildly context sensitive string languages can actually be characterized in terms of regular tree languages. So if we shift the representation that we focus our uh, formal analysis over, then we are, we are revealing kind of a parallel between the complexity of the dependencies in one kind of domain and the complexity of the dependencies in another kind of domain. This also means that we can maybe use the insights that we have gotten from the computational study of phonological patterns to look at syntactic characterizations in a slightly novel way. Uh, and so here I'm gonna have a you know, 30 second sketch example, but we can talk about more, more about it if you want later on. So here I have a representation of a very basic C2NC3, uh, except that is a, a derivation tree for a grammar formalism called minimalist grammars is due to Ed Stabler. And the main difference from constituency tree is that I have these unary branches that represent movement dependencies. So movement dependencies are basically long distance dependency. So there is a dependency between this red A and this move red in here and this move in here. Uh, and so starting from the observation that this kind of formalism creates a regular tree language, you can say, well, if I want to check the dependent, the complexity of checking, the well-formedness of this kind of long distance dependencies, can I do it in from a subregular perspective? And interesting is that maybe I can do it in the same way. I, I can project tiers starting from the trees. These are gonna be slightly different tiers than the one that we saw before, because they have three tiers. So I'm preserving, for example, the dominance relations, but the concept is the same, right? I'm exploiting the same formal intuition over slightly different representations. Uh, and so this observation and this kind of formalisms create regular tree languages is not particularly new, uh, but has again inspired a variety of uh, very interesting research into the subregularity of syntactic operations, syntactic dependencies over tree representations um, by a bunch of very smart people, smarter than me. Uh, here I have some um, pictures by Maya Hoon, Azila Shafie, Sabine Lashkovich, and uh, Shari Kawa. And that they have worked exactly in looking at this kind of what happens if I look at syntactic dependencies not over strings, but maybe over this kind of structural representations that syntacticians care about. Uh, and again, Thomas and I have done some work that is trying to wonder whether restricting the complexity of operations over tree in this way has some correlations to making, for example, uh, uh, parsing searches over tree forest is more efficient. And again, we can talk about that. But um, Again, I'm gonna take a breath and see whether you have any questions, but I want to summarize that again, what's the point that we're doing here? We're trying to look at the fact that looking at linguistic dependencies through this kind of fine-grained formal characterizations is a good way of uh, highlighting fundamental differences between patterns, but also fundamental similarities between patterns if we consider the kind of the right kind of structural representations. And so it also allows to play around a bit with this kind of uh, trade-off between complexity of the devices and complexity of the representations in a way that are not seem trivial done from other perspectives. So this gives us a unified way of talking about tested and unattested typology. For example, well, we don't seem to find counting patterns across this linguistic domain, um, maybe for the same reason, right? Because regular languages, whether they are on strings or on trees, don't allow for these kind of things. 
And again, they can give us some insight into learnability, both in terms of this general kind of learning framework, but again, more importantly, in terms of what kind of primitives learning systems might have to be sensitive to, to learn languages from these kind of clusters. Uh, and so in the next part of the talk, I'm gonna try to stress this idea that, yeah, we have based this observation on typological explorations, but this is giving us a tight connection to uh, learnability predictions and how do we look at those. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. if you have any kind of questions, I can stop for a bit. Take a seat. Yeah, uh, d does anybody have any questions about, um, about like the previous section? Before before we move on to the next, you don't have to. I understand that is a very yeah, no, no. <laughs> no, no. I think that like uh, I, I think you uh, you is like sufficiently enamored us. So uh, so <laughs> so I think we all want to hear more. So, um, so, but uh, if you want to take a second before you start with artificial grammar learning, like you know, we uh, we can take a we can take a moment. Uh, yeah, I'm good. I mean, if people don't have immediate questions, I can just go on. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I, 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 I have a question. Um, and it might be a not very smart one because I'm not very familiar with with formal languages, um, but. Initially, you were talking about these formal languages in terms of uh, we we being able to to understand uh, kind of like uh, our learnability constraints and and which kind of formal languages we can represent, and then you moved into this uh, tier um, local language or or. I forgot the, the name, but that basically allows you to ignore some certain parts of the input and represent mm -hmm. like long distance uh, dependencies. But do you, do you think like how do you tie that back with with um, like our mental representations of, of the mm -hmm. phonetics itself? Do you think that's like yeah. Even if that's simpler than other kinds of formal languages, at the same time, it, it seems a bit less realistic, uh, at mm. least to me, I, I'm not sure. Um, like, do, do you have anything to say about that? Uh, yeah, no, no, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, so the point is um, that, that, you know, this kind of tier based approach to the long distance is actually the simplest one, right? So uh, you could analyze the same things in terms of formal, you know, finite automata, like fully regular languages, but they will have to keep track of the same kind of information, right? That the, these two segments that are separate from each other are related to each other in a way that all the segments in between are not. So finite state automata will do exactly the same thing. Uh, so that's why uh, I'm pointing out that this kind of languages really reveal What's the fundamental thing that you have to do if you want to capture long distance dependencies? It's is that you have to capture the fact that there is a relation between two segments uh, that kind of ignores everything else in between. Uh, unless you don't think that's what's happening, right? But so you could think, no, actually the relation is between all the immediate segments, but then that makes it simpler actually because it makes it local at every step. But if you think the relation is actually non-local, uh, then this is the simplest thing that you can do as a kind of logical relation between just sibilants. And the, uh, you're right that it, it's a bit unintuitive, maybe um, when I'm representing it with these kind of tier graphs, and one can think, is there really what's happening cognitively? But that's, for me, it's just an uh, abstract way of showing the relation. Uh, but again, you can formalize it, for example, in terms of regular expressions in a similar way, where it's not like you are deleting segments, you are just saying, uh, sibilance are the only thing that matter, right? Or you could draw a finite state automata right, that looks that loops over a single state by ignoring everything that is not a sibilant. Um, so these are all alternative mechanisms that can represent the same dependency, but the core thing is still that you have to ignore a bunch of stuff that doesn't matter to you, right? And so that's what the tier based approach is highlighting, this idea that this is what we are ignoring, but we are maintaining the, um, the relative order of those two segments. Because you could think, oh, I just want to conceive of uh, sibilance as a set, 
uh, as long as they are all equal, it doesn't matter. Uh, but here you see, no, actually, I want to conceive of sibilance as being just sibilance, but I want to keep the ordering relation. Does that help a bit in addressing what you were asking? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. So, so in a sense, you're kind of like proposing a more constrained way to to think about the, the same problem, but at the same time, you're trying to like this would just be an abstract way of talking about like memory constraints or or, or, or things like this, um, but in a more constrained way than a fully uh, context-free grammar or something like this. Yeah, so it's really just a way of highlighting what's the minimum kind of information you need that you have to consider. Then you might say, well, maybe I actually want to do it with the context-free grammar, right? Uh, but the point, the point is that it doesn't take away from the fact that, the, that to recognize local constraint, you don't have to consider this kind of uh, relativize operators, but in order to do long distance dependence, you do. And so looking at these more restricted formalisms just highlights differences between these kind of proper classes that otherwise, you know, if we were using more powerful devices, we would be losing. And then it's a good question of whether we are actually sensitive. This is actually a good segue to this third part of the talk, uh, which is uh, it's a good question about, okay, so are we actually sensitive to this kind of um, inf information differences. Maybe we are not, right? If we treat everything with finite state automata, maybe it's more reasonable to uh, flatten out all these differences. It doesn't matter because the automata can do everything, right? Um, but this is really in a way of asking that kind of questions in a way that we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to do if we were just thinking about the edges of this kind of complexity classes. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I think that, I, that helps. It, it's a, but I mean, it's a great, it's a great question, right? It is the question that we should be asking. What, what's the advantage of doing this instead of, you know, uh, using, you know, a Turing complete kind of mechanism that is clearly going to be able to do all of these kind of things, right? Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so this is a good segue to this third part of the talk in the sense that, uh, yes, this kind of um, proposals that I've been suggesting, they are based on this kind of topological observations, right? So these are properties of the patterns that we see. Um, and one might say, well, but, you know, our knowledge of the topology is obviously limited in so many ways, right? It's limited because we can only collect finite data. It's limited because the way we collect this finite data is biased by a bunch of socioeconomic kind of issues. Uh, and it's limited because, you know, variation is, can due to, be due to so many other things. Like there are my languages that we haven't found yet or that have disappeared that might have properties that we have not considered. Um, so is this enough to make claims about the fact that we are sensitive to this kind of complexity differences? Um, and the advantage of, again, doing this through this kind of formal lenses is that then it really, is, if, since we are pinpointing these differences in fundamental units of information, then we have precise questions to be asking, for example, in laboratory settings. And one way of doing that is through this lens of artificial grammar learning uh, experiments, um, also known as, um, what did I do? Sorry, I skipped it. Okay, uh, also known as artificial language learning experiments. And I'm not gonna go into the difference between those. Let's use those interchangeably. And it's this idea that we can use this kind of experimental framework to test implicit learning abilities of our participants with respect to specific properties in the inputs that they are exposed to. Um, so one of the first attempts of using that in linguistics goes back to Reber in, in 76, uh, which was actually using uh, fine state automata to uh, characterize the properties of the inputs that they were interested in analyzing. Uh, but the basic idea of this kind of learnability setups is that you might be interested in seeing whether participants are sensitive or are able to learn the properties of you know, linguistic patterns that fit specific um, constraints. And so you might say, oh, are they able to learn the language that respects the um, regularity imposed by a specific kind of grammar? The way you will do, you might expose participants to a finite set of stimuli conforming to the properties of that language. And then after the learning phase, you might test them on their ability to discriminate between stimuli that still 
fit the rules of the language and stimuli that do not. Now we can play with this framework a bunch, right? We can play, play, play eh, sorry, we can play with uh, what the training set looks like, right? So you might think, well, actually, I want to train them also with stimuli that do not conform to the language. Uh, you could play with the test set. Um, with the relative size of the test sets or with how we are doing this, like we could do it in one batch. I, I train you and I test you and that experiment is over, or you could do it iteratively. So I can train you, then I test you, maybe I give you some feedback, then I train you again and I test you again, etc. So these are all manipulations about the learning, the idea, our ideas of learning that we can do, but the basic setup is still this. And I want to point out that um, the, this contrast between these two test sets, the one that conforms to the rule of the grammar and the one that doesn't, is really, really tricky. Uh, and if we don't pick those properly, it's really tough to make reasonable generalizations from the results that we get. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into that softbox, but we can talk about it later on if you want. Uh, and then we might have concerns about, uh, you know, ecological validity of this kind of results. And again, we can talk about those. Uh, but the fundamental thing is that this is a technique that has been used extensively in linguistics to do a bunch of stuff. And here I have a very shallow kind of summary of the kind of things that you can do. There is way, way more. Uh, but you can, again, you can test sensitivity of participants to particular properties of the stimuli in the input, both behaviorally and with neuro, neuro um, logical experiments, it's been used to test differences between child language acquisition and humor and adult language acquisition. And it's been used a lot to ask questions about uh, comparative cognition between humans and other kind of animal species. And now this is the kind of stuff, as I said, in which uh, being able to really pinpoint what is the differences between this yellow circle that I would I'm asking whether subjects can learn in this red circle, which is things that you, they should be able to discriminate over. This seems to be very compatible with the kind of complexity boundaries made by this kind of hierarchies. Meaning that if we think that humans are sensitive to this kind of complexity hierarchies, then we should be able, we should, we could speculate that, for example, learning patterns that belong to languages at the bottom of this kind of hierarchy might be easier than learning patterns that belong to languages at the top of the hierarchy. Again, so far I've been talking about these kind of things as kind of hard boundaries, but we don't have to conceive it that way. Like we can talk about biases towards lower complexity classes over higher complexity classes. Uh, we could also do slightly uh, smaller manipulations, right? We could wonder whether humans are sensitive to this kind of logical operators in different ways. But importantly, again, since these kind of classes pinpoint these kind of fundamental properties of the patterns, then uh, we can also look in a slightly more formal ways of whether there are differences between classes of attested patterns and classes of unattested patterns. So a classic example is this contrast on this slide here. Uh, here I have the uh, unbounded sibilant harmony case that we saw before where um, every sibilant in a word needs to harmonize. And so, for example, this word here on the left is ill-formed because these two sibilants are not agreeing in anteriority. Now, a variation of this pattern, and this is a, represented this way to show you that it's a tier-based tricky local language. Now, a variation of this pattern is what's called your um, first-last harmony process. Now, this is basically sibilant harmony, except that the harmony only has to hold between elements in the beginning and end of the string. So things in between don't really matter. And so it, this is why here, uh, this, uh, this string on the left, this is well formed actually, because there is this harmony violation, but it doesn't matter because this first uh, is not at the beginning of the word, as we saw in the string on the left. And now this is a similar pattern, but it's not tier-based strictly local, because for those languages, there is no way of saying, oh, this sibilant is at the beginning of the word, and this sibilant is in the middle of the word, and there are different, um, and it's also unattested. And so we can make this hypothesis that is, well, okay, so if I were to train subjects on uh, whether they are able to learn an unbounded sibilant harmony versus an unbounded first last harmony kind of pattern, the first last harmony pattern should be tougher to learn. And this is in fact something that has been done, is a work by Regine Lai in 2015, so Regine was testing exactly these kind of things, right? So they were looking at stimuli like something conforming to both first last and sibilant harmony. So we have three sibilants, they all agree in a feature, something that doesn't conform to either. So we have three sibilants and maybe the last sibilant or the first sibilant disagree with the rest. And then we have 
stimuli that conform to the first last harmony pattern. So the first and last stimulant agree on a feature, but that don't conform to the sibilant harmony pattern because something in between doesn't. Um, and so what uh, and they did in this paper was to train participants on a first last harmony appropriate set of items, a sibilant harmony appropriate set of items, and then they had a control group that was just not trained. And the task was a uh, first choice kind of task. So participants were shown, for example, this kind of contrast, right? They were shown um, an item that fits the first last harmony rules, but not the sibilant harmony, compared to another an item that doesn't fit any. And the idea is, well, if you were trained on sibilant harmony, that you should not be able to distinguish between those two, uh, because they both violate the structure of the grammar. And so you should kind of perform a chance, kind of like the control. But if you were trained on first last harmony and you internalize that rule, then you should be able to prefer this kind of item over this other kind of item and so perform better than chance and definitely better than the control. So let's look quickly at the results. Um, so here on the x-axis on this dot on the left, we have the kind of um, training setups. So the control group, the first last harmony trained, the sibilant harmony trained, and participants were asked to choose between these two. So an item that fits both sibilant harmony and first last harmony, an item that doesn't fit either. And this is the rate of choosing the conforming one. And so we can see that the control group behave as expected below chance, and both the trained group instead be behave above chance, showing that they, yeah, they seem to have learned something that makes them prefer this one over the one that doesn't conform to any kind of armory rule. Um, now, the graph on the right is the in more interesting one. This is again, this on the x-axis is the same training groups, but they were shown an item that conform only to first last harmony versus something that doesn't conform to either. And this is the rate of choosing the conforming item over the non-conforming one. Now, in here, we would expect the sibilant harmony group to behave as the control group. And this is uh, because there is no way for them to discriminate between these two. So this, this result is exactly what we were expecting. But the first last harmony group should have performed better than the other two, because they should have internalized a way of distinguishing this first last item versus the non-conforming one. And so they didn't. And so Lai takes this as evidence that um, you know, both participant groups are internalizing something, but there is something about the first last harmony that makes it tougher to converge to the actual property of the rule. Um, and we can talk about these results a bit more if you want, but I want to point out if you have issues with experimental design, this has been replicated with slightly different methodologies very recently. In particular, this up to an aesthetic paper does a very careful uh, control of the results. And um, and there are, there are a bunch of additional things that we can be doing. Like we, can, we could be playing with the sensitivity of the subjects, these kind of things. But I just want to uh, mention that once we think this is a reasonable framework in, to, in which to ask these kind of questions, then we can do kind of slightly more speculative kind of predictions. So for example, we could make the observation that imagine that there are two patterns, like A and B, and they are both tier based with local patterns. We could imagine a combined pattern, like the union of those two. Now, what happens if that is not a tier based with local pattern? Uh, then we will make the prediction that this combined not tier style pattern should be harder to learn than those two separately. This might be you know, a weird way of setting this up. So it's, it's based, in fact, on an observation that Axionova, Graf, and Moradi made about uh, compounding patterns in languages. I'm going to show you this very quickly. Um, so they, in this paper, this is a 2016 paper, they make this observation that Russian has um, um, a compounding, nominal compounding pattern marked by infixes like O. And so this is an iterable kind of compounding pattern. Turkish has also a similar a kind of compounding pattern, except that this time is marked by the suffix C, which is not iterable, it can only occur once. And so both of these patterns are uh, tier based with local. We just need to project tiers of these compounding markers and affix and stamp edges. And they say, well, we can imagine conceivably, it's logically possible, a pattern that is the combination of the two. So um, it's uh, iterable compounding of nominals in the stem, but they are marked by suffixes instead than my infixes. And now this, can, this results in a trivially non subregular pattern that is an n plus one to the n kind of pattern, so it's um, not even regular. And so they, they use this to make predictions about what kind of compounding patterns we should expect in the typology of languages, but we could convert it into a learnability prediction, which is if we were to train subjects on a Russian-like compounding pattern, on a Turkish-like compounding pattern, and then on a Turkish Rushkish one, and then we would expect the Rushkish one to be tougher to internalize. 
Um, and so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna see if you have any questions. But again, there are multiple things that we could be doing with this kind of artificial grammar experiments. But the idea is that again, the formal language theoretical characterizations are giving us way of setting up testable predictions in a way that is not speculative, but is really at the level of these fine grained properties of the patterns that we are testing. And so, yeah, the typology by itself might not be enough, but we could add evidence to sensitivity or not of these kind of patterns, thanks to this kind of experimental devices. Tip of tip. Thanks so much. Does anybody have uh, any questions here? I, I have a question, but I'll wait until, uh, until others go first. Right, I'll just jump right into it then. Uh, so I guess um, thinking about that experiment, you, I'm I'm trying to remember which of the which of the two um, structures was more expected. I think it was slide 36. Yeah, yeah, 30, yeah, perfect. So the sibilant harmony was expected to outperform the first last uh, in terms of recognition, right? Is that what you were saying? And it and it did not, right? It was it was essentially flatter the first last overperform. So why was yeah. the sibilant harmony expected to overperform versus the first uh, last? No, it's not really overperform. It's a matter of um, wh whether you, it's expected to be learned or not, right? Um, right. So, so in this case here, on the um, so the, the crucial difference is that the first last is both more complex and unattested, as far as we know. Unless you know, maybe some of you as an evident, have, you know, a case of a language maybe in southern Italy where this is attested, and it's cool. Uh, but the observation here, at least in 2015, was first last is unattested and is slightly more complex. So we would expect that given the same amount of input, it should be tougher to internalize. And so uh, in this first graph, which, what this first graph is showing is that we are learning this, we, participants are learning the sibilant harmony, and they're also learning the first last. So they seem like they behave the same. Uh, but if we look at the case that discriminates this one, that only checks whether they are actually learning just first last harmony, mm -hmm. it looks like they are actually not learning. So this, this low performance of sibilant harmony here is expected because there is no way that sibilant, a sibilant harmony rule allows you to discriminate between these two. These are stimuli like um, this one at the bottom left in the graph, like sh, 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 sh. S, 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 versus S, 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 right? So those are both bad for a sibilant harmony rule. So you would expect participants that are trained to those to treat them the same. They're both ill-formed. I don't know which one to pick. I'm going to pick randomly. Uh, but the first last harmony people should see that the second one is bad, uh, but that the first one is fine. And so they should pick this better if they had internalized the rule, but it doesn't seem they do. So, so the thing that is ex unexpected is that on this contrast, they behave the same, they shouldn't. The first last harmony people should behave significantly higher in terms of discriminatory ability. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it does, it does. I just, I, I think what I was misunderstanding too is, so for the examples for like uh, sibilant harmony and, and, first, and first last, uh, more, uh, first last assimilation, um, you're mentioning the, the such, uh, so it sounds like the, that ser that series of I'm trying to remember of phonemes. I don't know if that's the right terminology for it. That the, this those sounds um, were other sounds selected for uh, for testing. Like what was what was the sample size of them? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, so I actually don't remember what's the amount of stimuli that they gave. It's uh, it's approximately the normal one in this kind of experimental setups. Um, but but you're right that this is only this was only a test on sibilants, right? So the harmony pattern is only across sibilant segments, and they they vary. So the reason this is a three kind of sibilants. If we look, this kind of thing. So <clears throat> these are CV 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 kind of words, which is kind of what you want to do, right? You want to check that the the number of syllables across segments is still the same. And what they did vary was the uh, the kind of vowels that you have in between. So the, the, the kind of segments that you have in between these words is varied, but the harmony is only tested across sibilants. Because sibilant harmony is kind of a common kind of pattern. But it's a good question. So, uh, you know, this is an interesting alternative explanation is, is there something to do with maybe the prominence of sibilants uh, that maybe, you know, if we were testing a kind of voicing harmony across obstruents, you will not see. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, there is a bunch of variation that you can do uh, on this kind of experience to actually test. Is the is 
the formal characterization really the only possible difference between these two sets of stimuli. Uh, but if you think so, right? So if you think that the difference between these two control groups is really just uh, this complex, this difference between, or the two siblings have to be at the beginning at the end, or the two siblings have to be anywhere in the world, um, then this is kind of consistent with what we were expecting. Got it. Yeah, no, this makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Thanks for jumping in on that. Um, does, any, does anybody else have questions about like this experiment or, or uh, artificial grammar learning in general? Okay, I guess I guess we can jump on to the the conclusion, which is like uh, sounds good because we're at uh, we're at just about an hour in. So right. Um, yeah, and um, you know, if you want later on, we can talk about more about this. And Lai has additional kind of additional experimental conditions that here for the sake of time, I didn't talk about, but we can. Um, okay, so let me very quickly summarize what I've been saying so far. Right, it's been an hour. Thanks for sticking with me for the full hour. Um, so I've been trying to say, okay, so we can. There is a rich tradition of looking at linguistic dependency through this kind of formal language theoretical characterizations, mostly in terms of mechanisms, automata, push down automata versus fine state automata versus you know Turing machines. And what I've been trying to make the case here is that we can look at those same characterizations in this kind of more fine grained perspective that don't lose us the advantage of thinking about mechanisms, but really highlights the properties of these kind of patterns. And so maybe they allow us to. Do, these are characterizations that we can make more precise by looking at the topology, but importantly, they allow us to make a precise commitment about what kind of minimal units of information distinguish the local patterns versus the non-local pattern, which is more complicated kind of patterns. And so also to draw more clear distinctions about, oh, these are the classes of phenomena that I see, and that seems to need this kind of sensitivity to these kind of properties. And these are classes of phenomena that I don't see, but it also don't seem that would seem to require properties that I don't see in any other of the attested patterns. This is, there is a more stark contrast between attested and unattested patterns. Um, and so this is an approach that fundamentally relies on the exploration of attested linguistic phenomena in, in ways that allow us to make generalizations about linguistic processes more broadly. And so this allows us to make predictions about differences between attested and unattested patterns. And you might say, well, okay, but I still have this lingering objection that you know, our knowledge of attested phenomena is fundamentally limited. It's true, right? Um, and this is also, this kind of abstract characterizations uh, make some strong idealizations about things that we know that matter for linguistic correlation like contact and historical development and articulatory reasons. Um, and so is it reasonable to make generalizations about these kind of patterns that we have not encountered? Uh, and in fact, this might remind you of something that you might have heard in other areas of um, scientific investigation, or maybe not, so I'm gonna mention it to you. Just this idea of black swan events. These are events that are deemed to be improbable, but they actually tend to happen. Uh, and it's, they're called black swans events because for a long time in the history of zoology, black swans were thought not to exist, uh, except that then in the, I think in the 17th century, uh, they were actually found, and of course today we know that they exist is a beautiful example of a black swan. And so you, of course then the theory of zoology at the time that had been built on this idea that black swans didn't exist had to be kind of restructured and we thought about. And so you say, well, isn't this exactly what we're doing, right? We're making speculations about things that we don't expect to see, but it actually might happen. And Actually, one of the problems that I don't think this is not exactly what we're doing, but uh, to make that point, let me extremize this view and say, well, okay, so our understanding of, you know, biodiversity and evolutionary trajectory and biology itself has clearly improved from the 17th century to today, right? And our type, taxonomy of existing animal species has also clearly improved. But still, I think we will be, um, it would be hard to say that we have definitely encountered every possible animal species that ever existed. And in fact, you know, new animal species keep popping up, uh, especially in Australia, um, but you know, they could be popping up in other parts of the world. That said, uh, so imagine I would say, well, okay, so uh, I want to say that maybe we should expect to, to find flying pigs, maybe in Southern Italy, which is famous for having pigs roaming around. Um, and, but I will still make the claim that based on our understanding 
of Earth biodiversity. A theory that deems flying pigs to be probably unexpected is more plausible than a theory that says, yeah, every possible biological combination should be expected. Now, notice that here I'm not making the claim that distinguishing between black swans, these are these rare events that we expect to see, and flying pigs, which is the event that we don't expect to see, is trivial. I'm actually making the claim that it's a very subtle distinction, but that these kind of formal characterizations allow us to at least try to draw these kind of boundaries. Why do not I, why I don't expect to see some things? Why do I expect to see things, even if they are rare? And so the difference here between the kind of black swans kind of events is that we are not making generalizations based on single missing data points. We're making generalization based on classes of phenomena that we see and classes of phenomena that we don't see. This also allows us to underline what the value of having a restrictive theory is. So the goal of the formal approach that I outlined here is not to rule out phenomena as categorically impossible, but we're trying to give uh, you know, this kind of formal analysis of tested patterns in order to make precise explanatory generalizations about expected empirical phenomena. And so the value of it, this kind of restrictive theories is that they are predictive, yes, but uh, Andrea Martinez, this very, very nice sentence says, prediction is not explanation by themselves. It's kind of restrictive theories are predictive, but those are explanatory in the sense that they motivate where those kind of predictions are coming from. This also means that they're easily, easily they are falsifiable. And so if you go back to flying pigs, you know, uh, if flying pigs happen to turn out, a theory that deems them implausible for specific understanding of our biological theories will learn more from their existence than the theory that was fully unrestricted and assumed that everything should be possible. In similar way, should patterns that kind of exceed our current complexity characterization turn out, the way that I actually showed you at the beginning of the talk, this would this will have no influence on the fact that, you know, the characterizations that we have given so far are still true for those patterns. So this difference in information units are still true, but also will point out to how we have to modify our theory to make space for those in a way that assuming a Turing complete theory of phenotopic knowledge wouldn't. So it allow us to highlight differences between these things and learning from falsification. Um, so, very, very quickly, I'm going to give you then an example of how these kind of restrictive theories are not meant then to be reductionist. So I'm not saying that complexity characterizations are the only thing that matters. I'm saying that complexity characterizations are a way for us to then uh, focus on kind of uh, differences between patterns that might be also coming from other dimensions. So for example, so far I have looked at complexity distinctions across classes, but we could look at, at complexity distinctions within a class, right? So saying that long distance dependencies are not tier-based are tier-based local doesn't mean that every possible tier-based local pattern should be equally attested. So uh, I'm going to base this on some work done by Leon Axenova and Sanke Deshmukh. Based on, again, this observation about t possible tier configurations, right? So they, based on this idea of multiple tiers, they notice, well, what's the, what are the conceivable relations between segments on these tiers? And we could expect um, these joint tiers, so tiers that have no segments in common. We could expect tiers like this, when one tier is contained into the other, right? So you have a tier of sibilance, and then you have a tiers of sibilance plus something else. And then we could expect uh, a tiers of so, sets of intercepting tiers. So tiers that have sibilance in common, but then one tier has vowels and the other tier has obstruents. Um, and these are all conceivably possible, and they are all of, of equivalent complexity given this kind of uh, multi tier characterizations. But then they did this kind of topological study, then they noticed that, well, we have cases of the trivial, I only actually need one tier. Uh, we have cases as the one that I showed be you before, these containment relations, and we have cases of these joint tiers, but we don't seem to find harmony patterns that actually need intersecting tiers to be accounted for. Now, this is not clearly explained purely by the, the, uh, the complexity distinctions. But thinking about this in terms of this kind of tier characterizations made Axenova and Deshmuk think about, OK, so imagine that I'm a learning system and I have to infer all these possible combinations from the input. How would, that, how would the amount of possibilities that I have to consider change depending on these logical combinations? And they showed this on a log-log scale uh, this showed that if I have to entertain this kind of intersecting sets, the amount of combinatorial operations that I actually have to entertain and compare to the input is exponentially bigger than in the other two configurations. And so this, again, it's showing how um, some of these 
attested and attested difference may be done arise directly from the complexity characterizations, but the formal lens highlights how allow us then to ask slightly deeper questions about the relations with learnability processes. Um, and um, so this makes connections with learnability in general. So I mentioned that this kind of formal language uh, allow us to formulate probably correct learning algorithms. And those might seem to be in slightly of idealized learning settings, but the useful of those is that since they are probably correct, they allow us to ask questions about the properties of the inputs in ways that uh, other kind of learning algorithms don't. Um, and so in a work that we did last year on this kind of multi-tier grammars, uh, and then I showed that, yeah, we have probably correct learning algorithms for these grammars. They actually don't need any information about the properties of the tiers or the constraints. They only need to know that, they, that we want them to infer tier structures. And we showed that, yeah, they can learn efficiently from input, but in order to do that, the algorithm uh, naturally ignores this kind of intersecting classes. Um, and so this relates again to the structure is predicted by the structure of the grammars per se, and this kind of learnability consideration that Aliana showed empirically before. Uh, and so again, so these uh, could, you know, these are learnability predictions that we're making in formal terms, but we could test them empirically. In fact, I have a pilot study that I wasn't able to run in time, unfortunately, but it tests exactly these kind of predictions and we'll see what happens. Uh, but the crucial thing uh, is that we can collect to it to more general, broader uh, learning learnability considerations, but this is also alighting the fact that pointing out these fine grained properties of the pattern is, us, is allowing us to ask questions about what kind of things our learning systems have to be sensitive to. So we can do it with human systems, we can do it with artificial systems. Uh, this is not gonna come to any surprise to many of you, there is a variety of work nowadays that tries to connect uh, formal language theoretical characterizations to properties of neural networks, for example. There is very interesting work by Gail Weiss. Um, Brandon Pickett has actually a very recent result in the last issue of the journal of Logic, Language and Information, uh, replicating those kind of lie experiments that I've showed you with uh, artificial neural networks. Uh, so the reason I'm only emphasizing this work here uh, by Mahalunkar and Kelleher is because um, instead of looking at differences between complexity classes, is in fact fixing a complexity class. These strictly piecewise languages they are basically um, skip gram models and using that to test the sensitivity of the learner to other kind of properties of the patterns, like the length of the dependency, the alphabet size, what kind of alphabet elements that we are using. And so this is a way of saying, well, yeah, fixing the properties of the language allows me to control my data in the input, my benchmarking data, in ways that doing it in other ways would not allow me to. So again, this was a bit fast, uh, but I'm gonna shut up by saying that this issue of the fact that our empirical observations are limited is an issue of all the empirical sciences. It's not just an issue of linguistics. Um, and so how do we build satisfying theories of linguistic knowledge? So here I'm citing this uh, piece from uh, Iris Van Rogi and uh, Baggio, 2020, aimed at cognitive scientists, but I think it's very relevant for us, which is if we have to build our theories from observations. We're gonna do it by building candidate hypotheses and evaluating their explanatory power. Uh, this is important because it's not gonna allow us to falsify them. And so the claim here is that approaching these kind of questions to this kind of uh, formally specified definitions allow us to uh, lay down the expectations of the theories in a way that doing it in other, uh, with other approaches doesn't. Um, and so, again, for me, this is a truly collaborative enterprise, meaning that it's not just about forcing the mathematics and the linguistics or uh, forcing the linguistics into the cognitive science. It's really asking these questions from a cognitive science perspective and a formal perspective and a linguistic perspective all at the same time. Um, so I'm actually really gonna shut up now. Uh, I should thank a bunch of people, especially all the people that I've cited so far, but I'm only gonna thank you for sticking with me for an hour and past. Uh, and yeah, and I'm gonna end up with uh, self-plugging because you're not too tired of these kind of things. Uh, Don Rusky and I have an um, upcoming chapter uh, summarizing this kind of reasoning and also discussing a bit how to properly use artificial grammar learning experiments. Uh, and that's a link to a paper in case you want it. Um, that's it. Thank you for speaking with me. Thanks so much for taking the time uh, and effort to like present this. This is, uh, I mean, um, it's, uh, 
I think this is the this is the biggest showing that I think I I've I've seen so far for any of the SIG type talks. So it's uh, people were very very interested. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for coming from all these different time zones. Oh, I see people from <laughs> Europe. And... Yeah, hopefully uh, Cat is still alive. At 5 yeah, now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again for waking up so early. <laughs> I'm gonna switch my tea to water. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but I, uh, so does anybody have any? I guess like parting questions now that it's now that it's completed on on like the full breadth of the talk. I, I definitely do, but I, um, uh, we got a message. That's some embarrassing. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess, like, with informal language theory, it seems like a formal language theory provides, like, some of the, like, methodology to, to, um, uh, to consistently evaluate like maybe a grammatical or syntactic structure as like equivalent or equivalently complex for then like like uh, future like iterations of you know uh, experiments to indicate like how like people or machines like process those degrees of like uh, complexity as defined by formal language theory is that roughly roughly on 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 target yeah I'll say so Okay, so I, like, like one thing that I guess would be um, is is kind of like immediately of interest is there's, um, like there's there's uh like you know different principles and different foundations on which like one could like describe or or understand complexity, which is like why like you offered you know your your caveat and frustration with the term at the beginning, uh, or your hesitancy. Um, so like, are there are there pitfalls that you often see in terms of like the definition or description of things as complex that you could maybe help us like break down a little bit more in a, in a more structural way to mm. kind of like make sense of? That's a great question. Um, let me, so I'm going to answer it generally and then I'm going to see whether that's what you want to know. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I, I think there are limitations to, um, all these different measures of complexity, right? So the formal language theoretical one is ignoring, as I mentioned, a bunch of stuff that uh, we might deem re relevant for complexity characterizations. Uh, the reason I find it interesting is because, again, is really shifting our attention to making claims about things that we don't see, which is, you know, the property of the devices, right? We, you know, are we encoding things in a way that a fine state automata or a push down automata recognize? I don't know. And those make claims, right? They make claims about differences in memory mechanisms that we might find cognitively interesting, like Fitch uh, has some very interesting work saying, oh yeah, the push down automata captures something about uh, the way human memory works when associated syntactic dependencies, but those are properties of the mechanisms, right? Uh, and so when we are asking questions about black box systems, I'm a bit resident, reticent and making big claims just about the properties of the mechanisms because we don't see them, right? So this kind of approaches uh, really allow us to ask questions about the properties of the patterns themselves. And then that the, we, then the mechanisms might be sensitive to those or not, right? But it's a better way to modulate what the question is about. The question is about the pattern and whether the pattern tells us something about the cognitive mechanisms. Uh, that said, on top of this, we might add, uh, for example, uh, something that I haven't talked about at all, and then I think sometimes it's viewed as being in contrast to this kind of formal characterizations, by which I don't, I think is in fact fully orthogonal. Of course, people are gonna disagree with me on this. Uh, but things, for example, measures about the, the size of the grammar, right? So measures of um, encoding efficiency or a minimal description length kind of thing, right? So those are really interesting measures of complexity that, uh, articulate complexity in ways that are different than the one that I did before here, right? And sometimes they might line up, but they, they don't necessarily do. So you could think of, uh, you know, uh, a regular expression characterization 
that is shorter than this kind of constraints that I've been writing. And so in terms of size of the grammar, the regular uh, expression might be simpler than the three local constraints. Uh, and so I want to say, well, so if I'm not sensitive to the complexity of the grammar in this sense, but I'm only sensitive to the encoding difficulty, then those will make better predictions. And we could test these kind of things. And so in this sense, you could see those as opposite. But in the other, I would say, well, but again, uh, this kind of uh, encoding measures are measures about mechanisms. They are not measures about the patterns. Like if the efficiency of the encoding is not a property of the pattern. The pattern is that, the one that I showed you, right? It's the sibilant harmony. How am I deciding to encode it uh, then as a fact of uh, what kind of encoding might be more efficient than the other? But it allows us to make commitments about how am I encoding this? Am I encoding it in terms of logic formulas? Am I encoding it in terms of automata? Am I encoding it in terms of uh, compressions of bit information? These are all equi equivalently, equivalently interesting assumptions uh, that I think uh, again, are compatible with this kind of questions, right? And say, okay, so if I fix the complexity of the characterization in these terms, then can I try to modulate, okay, an automata will predict this kind of differences, uh, uh, you know, a different kind of bit encoding will predict these other kind of difference, et cetera. And so these, for example, are those kind of complexity measures that I think are still very interesting and people have done, uh, I'm seeing interesting a lot, but uh, I, synonyms a lot. They have been doing very inspiring work, I think, in the kind of insights that we can get by looking at things like MDL. Uh, but they lack, they, they have the same issue that looking at things just in terms of automata as for me, uh, which is our shifting the perspective to uh, these representations that we don't see instead of the patterns themselves. Um, does it make sense? In, yes. You don't have to agree with me, but. Oh no no I, no well I mean like this is this is about like your your thoughts on this so, like right. um but I guess like I am so uh, to if I'm understanding right so that's uh so really like the formal language theory isn't necessarily providing a description of like or or theory of complexity as much as a um as a framework in which to consistently keep track of it to evaluate different means of defining complexity Right. Yeah. And so in, in, in a sense, of course, you know, the hierarchy per se, in terms of expressivity, is giving you these implicit notions of complexity. Um, and, and, you know, we have these kind of ways of testing whether we are sensitive to, but I think there is also value in saying, well, maybe we are not sensitive to this, these specific notions of complexity, but formalizing the patterns in this way is still going to be helpful for me to understand what am I asking questions about. Um, and so in that sense, yeah, you could see it as a framework uh, in which to um, ask then more detailed questions about other kind of things. Got it. Thank you. And, and I saw that it looked like, uh, Tiago, you on mic. I don't know if, uh, if you have a question as well. Yeah, I have one. Uh, it might be like not that uh, as good as yours, but uh, I was just wondering in the artificial grammar uh, learning experiments, uh, you have the distinction about like the pattern that people could learn and the pattern that people couldn't uh, learn. And the pattern that people could learn was in this uh, tier language that, uh, that you showed before. Was the pattern that they couldn't uh, learn uh, also, uh, modelable by a, a finite state machine or, or like, okay. So it was shown exactly that distinction between uh, finite state machines. And... Okay, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. No, but that's a cool question. And by the way, thanks for attending the talk while walking around. I really appreciate that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you actually, if you read the light paper, in that paper, they claim that the pattern is a non sub regular. I, I don't remember if she says that it's fully regular or if actually you need super regular expressivity. Uh, but uh, actually, I've worked uh, that shows now the pattern is actually sub regular. It's not even that much more complex than the sibilant harmony pattern, but it is more complex. You need a, more, a slightly more complex idea of what of how to define segments that are related to each other. So yeah, those are both sub-regular patterns, uh, but they are sub distinct in this kind of fire grain distinctions, which is pretty good for me. And do you, do you have a, a 
any idea of if that would become learnable if people were exposed to more examples of that or, or, or not? Yeah, I don't know, but that's the question, right? And in fact, that's why uh, I, I hope I was clear, uh, careful enough to often say that the, the hypothesis is not that the pattern is not non-learnable, uh, but it's tougher mm -hmm. to learn given the same amount of inputs, right? Uh, and so that's why the contrast is important. So we have two patterns, we give participants the same amount of inputs. Uh, one is learned, the other maybe is not. But you are right, right, that we can never really say oh, oh this this is unlearnable because we could always imagine you know the amount of input that we can feed participants in, in a reasonable amount of time um is always limited right i can keep them for an hour in lab in the lab maybe uh, an hour is too long for this kind of experiment but i could keep them for an hour uh but it's not like i can keep them for a month um and keep giving them input so i can never say uh, this is unlearnable. I can only say is it wasn't learned given the specific amount of input, right? So it's true, right? I could imagine that maybe if I doubled the inputs, uh, they 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 will converge to the right generalization. Or maybe if I play with the learning framework a bit more, maybe I give them um, feedback on how they are doing in the test phase. Maybe that's gonna be useful. And those are things that actually we can do, right? Um, it's exciting that we can do all these kind of variations. But the, the fact remains that for now, given the same amount of input, one was learned, the other was not. Right? Uh, and so there is this difference that's coming from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering like a bit about the distinction between like a, a, a more like NDL approach in formal uh -huh. language in terms of the learnability, because if you frame it in terms of MDL, then if you give it, enough data eventually people should learn uh, although like they have a, a smaller inductive biases towards those kinds of languages while if you say like oh this is the formal language that people uh can learn or something like this then uh, then it, it gives you a more constrained uh, setting so that's why i was wondering about that the distinction right and it's a good question but uh, you you don't have to view it that way, right? So that, that's true that often people present this kind of formal characterization as this is the boundary. So you either can learn this or cannot, uh, but you can look at the same thing as, a, as an inductive bias. And the inductive bias, instead of being for uh, this MDL simplicity, will be for the formal hierarchy simplicity, so, right? So you will you could see say the same thing, right? So yeah, the, the bias is only, I prefer the simpler characterizations. And if you give me more data, I'm gonna be able to learn the complex one, but I'm gonna first start by learning the simpler one. So uh, the, the formal language theoretical distinctions are often presented as categorical, just because the math is simpler, but you can put, you know, you can put stochastic distributions of, on top of those. And so you can think about, and that's also where, not thinking about the mechanisms, but thinking about these information differences help us because the mechanisms do those kind of hard boundaries. You either are a finite machine or you are a pushdown automata. And if you're a finite machine, you're not gonna be able to learn the pushdown automata kind of things. But thinking about this complexity difference in this finite grain way it says, no, I just have this complexity bias that says these are simpler classes. And so it's gonna be easier for me to learn those, but I can hypothetically, learn the more complex one maybe um so you're right that this is usually the way people understand this distinction but it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. there is nothing in the math that tells me that it has to be that way mm -hmm. so this is just a way to structure your almost like your priors over which kind of languages would be simpler and then you could yeah. uh, actually calculate your framework in terms of mdl because like uh they're just like different ways of thinking about like the same thing right and in fact you could use this kind of things for example to explore the kind of uh you know priors you have in a bayesian framework in the same way you would use mdl to explore those kind of priors too right it's just a different set of priors um but they don't have to be hard boundaries It makes sense. Like, do, do you think it will also show a distinction between the tier, uh, tier local 
languages and the only local uh, patterns in terms of like the, the amount of data people would need to learn them and things like this? Yeah, uh, so th th those have not been tested directly in this way, but those are a full distinction between local patterns and non-local patterns that we know from you know, purely linguistic kind of AGL studies that yeah, the non-local patterns just need more data to be learned. Um, not particularly surprising, um, but but we can look, you know, we can do a lot of experiments in this sense, right? We can play around with what kind of information all these different classes are doing and see, oh, these are things humans might be sensitive to, things that we might not be sensitive to. And again, we can do the same thing with uh, neural networks, right? We can check, or, oh, you know, hypothetically, you know, Gail has shown neural network can learn fine state automata, but um, actually, will they learn all these different classes in the same way, or they will have different kind of convergence patterns uh, based on the amount of input that I'm feeding? And and do you think, like, uh, if you if you frame it in terms of of like these priors over simplicity, and you have numbers for how much data people need to learn, like the the simple mm. local patterns, the non-local patterns, do you think you could try to extrapolate to how much data people would need for like more complex ones? And uh, Maybe, or, or... I, haven't, I haven't thought about that. It's a good idea. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Like in terms of the size of the, uh, of, of the of input the... size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I... Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that the characterizations give you an immediate intuitive way to understand what the jump in input data from these to these ones might be, but the, the, the probably correct learning algorithms might actually. So there might be a way of comparing uh, what we know from the human experiments, as you might mention, and, and then simulate those on the probably correct learning algorithms and get estimates from those. Uh, that's a good idea, actually. I hadn't thought of that, about that, yeah. It's a good project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's, it's conceivable. Like I know. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just saying that I usually think about these things in terms of MDL, but that's like my <laughs> uh, bias. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, but it's the same, right? And I, I try to I tend to think about these things in terms of these formal language theoretical things, but but that's why I, I it's really uh, matters to me that. Uh, it's not because I don't think that MDL generalizations are interesting, right? And not because I think they are in contrast to each other. I think that they are not, at least not in the way that we usually think about them, which is MDL allows us to think in terms of biases and formal language theory forces us to think in terms of cate categorical distinction. Uh, that's not a real distinction. Um, they both can be conceived in terms of uh, general biases over the learning space. Uh, and so they're, 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 these kind of things that you have been saying that, oh, we might be using this, I, this way in which we usually think about MDL to make, uh, to ask questions about the formal language theory. It's very interesting. I just haven't done that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just wondering as well, like, uh, like, because you also talked about like these formal languages given us uh, more like explainable hypothesis to what people how people conceptualize the, the processes. But then if you transform them into inductive biases, then th do you think you lose a bit of that uh, like uh, explainability hypothesis and then you go back to like have having more of like this probabilistic, uh, non-explainable, but more, I, I, I don't know if, if the question was clear, but I... Oh. No, I think it's clear. I don't expect so, but because I don't think that the non-explainability of other approaches comes from the probabilistic framework, right? Uh, so you, you could put probability distributions on, on top of these things. Uh, and, and I also don't think, you know, not everybody might agree that this kind of characterization gives us better ways of asking um, questions about whether uh, phenomena are truly cognitive like that or not. Uh, but I think, you know, understanding you know, formalizing the bias as being a bias between these kind of properties uh, is the thing that to me adds explainability. And then if you want to look at it as a bias, uh, it's okay because the bias is motivated by this idea that you know the distinction between this and this. In the same way that, you know, uh, 
talking about MDL kind of thing is not that it's unex uninterpretable by itself, right? So the MDL kind of biases are interpretable in the sense that they are biases for specific things. Uh, the difference for me was uh, whether those are biases for these representations that we don't see versus biases for properties of the patterns. Um, and so the claim is that these formal language approaches allow us to uh, to highlight what the properties of the patterns should be uh, and not speculate about the properties of the encodings uh, that might that are still important right then we have to do then that extra step um, but that's where the explainability for me comes from okay sounds good thanks <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the questions these are really good questions <laughs> Great. Well, um, uh, th does anybody have further questions? I, I hate to keep you more, but we're like at the hour and a half mark, so I don't want to like uh, plague you. If people have questions, I'm happy to answer, but otherwise, yeah, I thank you for sticking with me for so long. Yeah, no, this is incredibly interesting. I'm just like trying to think of like, uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, well, and you know, with, with Tiago's question, there was a recent paper that was discussing um, whether, uh, what was it? I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, researcher, but the but whether um, type theory should be replacing set theories like a foundation of mathematics mm. in particular domains. And um, and it seems like there was, there's been like, there's kind of a little bit of a history of, of the, there's like, there's application of set theory within like computing, right, for obvious reasons, but there's also an intersection of like type theory and linguistics consistently yeah. in that it sounds like in type theory, the emphasis is more where the elements also define the structure. Um, I could be mis I could be misrepresenting that I'm still learning this stuff and I was just wondering if this is an area of familiarity or interest to you. No, it's an area of. Uh, it's on top of my pile of things. Oh, I really wish I should. <laughs> right. I, I really should this, right? Yeah. Uh, but it sounds relevant, right? Uh, it's one of the things I'm like, oh, I should be learning this. Uh, <laughs> and, but yeah, so I have nothing to say about that except that. <laughs> right. Yeah. It is on my ever growing pile as well. So I was hoping that you would, uh, you would like help me be lazy and take it off that pile for me. Um, so. <laughs> But, uh, oh, Kat, did you have any, do you have any questions or thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I was a bit uh, like, it's it's 5 a.m. in my time, but I, I like, uh, I was always thinking like whether we can uh, um, kind of apply these uh, models in like, or use these models and approaches in this Sigma phone shared task and Vax and somewhat related to what Tiago was asking, like to what extent you can use those theories in order to evaluate these neural systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, something that I haven't really uh, spent too much time thinking about yet. Um, so Aria McCarthy and I have a uh, project that is on, so far only sketched in our emails in which we are uh, trying to design ways of testing a bit more this sensitivity of different um, neural network architectures to some of these complex differences. Uh, but for the more applied version, which is can we use it in the Sigma font task, for example, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so the ideal answer is yes, right? But this, uh, there, is, there is also a bit of a shift for now that much of this work has been done in these purely theoretical terms, right? Uh, compared to, you know, for example, the MDL people that have always done a very good work at actually implementing things that are useful immediately. Uh, and so there is a bit of a lack of um, immediate applications on the you know more direct kind of uh, things that we can do. So ideally, yes, but I haven't really stopped to think about how will I use this. And I'm also not particularly good of a morphologist, right? So uh, the Sigma task is in the back of my mind of things that I enjoy that I enjoy hearing about, but that I don't usually directly think about. Um, but so the answer is uh, the, for the exploring the abilities of networks, I think we can do it exactly in the same way that we have been doing with humans. Uh, and in the way, again, that Gail Weiss has been doing with, you know, for instance, automata, um, 
there's already a bunch of work uh, on using this slightly more fine-grained characterization. So in understanding the uh, the internal biases of this network, I think this is exactly the kind of formalisms that we want to be using because it allows us to pinpoint to these uh, fine-grained properties. Uh, and then in, is this useful, for example, in restricted damming ways that might be more appropriate, for example, for morphological tasks, so that maybe we don't go and consider the full spectrum of finite state of finite state dependencies, but we only look at these simple dependencies. Uh, yes, but I'm speculating. I I wouldn't be able to give you an idea of how to do that yet. Uh, it's a good project for a student, I think, to uh, try to. Yeah. It's interesting in terms of like uh, what kind of constraints you can maybe or something like uh, what what can you control in the data and uh, yeah. Yeah, and there is also a question. So there is this very interesting work um, uh, incorporating like explicitly biasing the networks like with logical operators. Um, so Vivex Ryan here at Utah actually has been done that kind of work and uh, this kind of approaches uh, I, I think go hand in hand very well with that because they, they tell you what kind of logical expressivity you might need, right? So maybe we don't need to buy as network with the full power of first order logic. We maybe just need uh, to restrict it to a conjunction of like negative literature, literals, and we will still be able to capture morphological dependencies in a way that is satisfying. Um, yeah, I think this is a, it's a great question to ask. And um, I'm sorry, I'm speculating more than even concrete ideas. Yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. <laughs> well, th thank you again for waking up before I am. I have to confess, I will not wake up before I am for anything in the world. <laughs> so I really, really appreciate it. It just speaks to how interesting the talk is. So th thanks so much for, for spending the time. Thank you for inviting me. It was really fun. And really awesome questions, much to think about for me. Yeah, uh, the, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, well, uh, thanks so much. Thanks again. Have a great evening, day, rest of the day. <laughs> Bye. Likewise. See you. Okay.